and Director of the Technology and Global Security Program at the Center for New American Security. I'm Nina Miller, a research analyst with Technology for Global Security, and I'll be helping moderate the questions today. I'm personally very excited for the opportunity to discuss autonomous weapon systems with you. Having watched the field develop over the past few years, I've seen the conversation shift dramatically in terms of what's possible technologically, and also how we should think about the human-machine relationship. This issue can also be tricky to discuss, um, in part because of hyperbole, and also very real concerns about, quote, killer robots. To kick things off, could you give us an overview of autonomous weapon systems? What are they? Who's developing them? And how are they currently being used? Uh, thanks. Well, thanks for having me. Thanks, everyone uh, who's joining. I'm very excited to be here today. Thanks for hosting this, Nina, and for having me on this. Um, you know, in, in its simplest form, autonomous weapons are a weapon that would make its own decisions about whom to kill on the battlefield. Um, that's, that's really the, the crux of the idea. I think there's actually widespread agreement um, among those debating this issue about sort of this high level concept of what an autonomous weapon is. It's when you get into the details that it begins to get really tricky. Um, and I'm going to start with an analogy to self-driving cars that might be a little bit easier, right? So um, the idea of a self-driving car is also pretty straightforward. It's a car that drives itself instead of a human you know, with their hands on the wheel driving it. But when you start to look at the technology, it's sometimes a bit of a blurry line. So you've got, on the one hand, very cutting edge automobiles today that have a lot of autonomous features that are being baked in. So if you buy like a new Mercedes today, I, I, I don't have one, but I'm told, <laughs> right? You buy like a top of the line automobile today, have a lot of um, autonomous features like automatic lane keeping or automatic collision avoidance, emergency braking. Then you've got maybe a next level above that are the Teslas that have an autopilot feature that's not totally autonomous. Uh, there are situations where the human has to intervene. And we've, of course, had some you know, lethal accidents where the autopilot has failed. Um, but that can get you know, some more functions. And then you know, something all the way to like the, the Google self-driving car where there is no steering wheel. But there are still some roles that the human plays. The human is telling the car where to go, right? You don't get into the car and say, like, car, just take me wherever, <laughs> right? Like the human decides the destination. So there are varying degrees of human involvement um, versus machine control over various kinds of tasks. And the same thing is occurring with weapons. So if you look at weapon systems, dating back to World War II, we've had weapons that take over certain kinds of functions on their own. Um, weapons that could control maneuvering a munition could be a torpedo or a missile to hit the aim point, you know, the, the object that the human has directed it at. It could be a GPS coordinate, or it could be, say, a ship or another airplane. Um, so you can think of these, they're not the same, but analogous to maybe existing automated features in cars, like, say, anti-life brakes, or automatic seatbelt retractors. These are automated functions that we've lived with for a long time. And that's not really what people talk about when we say autonomous weapons, right? That's autonomous weapons is usually something that is coming that's new that people are envisioning, right? It's something that's sort of looming on the horizon. Um, but there are lots of autonomous features we've already had. So when you sort of get into the details, uh, that's what kind of makes it really tricky. And we've had some areas where we've actually had quite a bit of autonomy, particularly in automated defenses. So this is probably some of the most automated systems we've had today in weapon systems. Um, and there are at least 30 countries around the globe that have had these automated defensive systems where most of the time a human is in control of this automated system. But there are automatic modes that a human can activate for missile defenses to defend against incoming missiles or aircraft, enemy aircraft that are approaching. These could be for land bases. They could be missile defenses to defend civilian areas like Israel's Iron Dome, or they could be on ships or on ground vehicles. Uh, on ground vehicles, they're called active protection systems to defend against things like RPGs, rocket propelled grenades that could come in to strike the vehicle, the um, armored personnel carrier or tank. But in all of these cases, there are these automated modes that humans can activate 
if there are situations where the, the time is so short, it's so compressed, that there's no way a human could respond in time. Or the number of threats coming in, it could be so many missiles coming in, uh, so many threats that a human can't, can't um, sort of react to all of them in time. So there are already some areas where in these sort of narrow domains of warfare, we've crossed the line to autonomous weapons. I think by, by any reasonable definition, those are autonomous weapons. So it's a murky problem because um, you have definitionally, you have issues of sort of, there's lots of different automation used in different ways. So where do you draw the line? We have some things that already maybe kind of cross the line to autonomous weapons. So it, it sometimes that conflicts with, I think, people's perception that autonomous weapons are like coming down the road. But also it's worth acknowledging this issue is super politicized, right? You have actors on all sides, um, NGOs, uh, nation states, that they want a certain outcome, right? Uh, they either want to ban autonomous weapons or they want to permit autonomous weapons or there are people with kind of views in between. Maybe they want some form of regulation. And that makes just, just getting everyone to agree what we're talking about very hard because when the term itself is politicized, now, even getting people to agree on how they define it becomes a challenge because people are sort of trying to play uh, games with the definition to move the goalposts, right? Um, forward or backward on the issue. And that, uh, that makes it hard sometimes because you have people talking about it and they're talking past each other, sometimes accidentally, sometimes deliberately. The last point I'll make about this is that just even in the popular mind, right? And one of the things that I think is great about this topic um, is over the last couple of years, it has quickly moved from an area of sort of like esoteric academic debate or debate among diplomats to one that has captured um, a lot of interest among the general public. Um, I realize it's maybe a bit self-serving because I wrote a book on this, but like, but, for the, but I'll just, I'll acknowledge that, but like for the issue itself, right? For the issue itself, I think it is really good that people are interested in this and they're engaged and you see um, you know, open letters being written by roboticists. You see sort of a wider segment of society engaged in this because look, we all have a stake in this, right? Like whatever future militaries are building, we're all going to live in that world, right? So we all have a stake in kind of the outcome of this, this debate. Um, but even in just the popular imagination, it is, it is a hard thing to deal with because people have different visions in their minds when you use these terms, right? If I just say like autonomous weapon to somebody who's not been steeped in these issues, you're gonna have some people that are envisioning a Roomba with a gun on it. They're envisioning something like relatively simple today that you could build and they might go like, well, that's a, that doesn't seem like a great idea, right? And then you have other people that are envisioning the Terminator, which is further down the road. Also, probably a really bad idea, but for very different reasons. Right. And so that, you know, some of it's just bound up in these terms like autonomy or our perceptions of robotics. Some people think about the technology today, which is brittle, has, you know, many problems. Some people are envisioning things like in the future, things of science fiction that may or may not happen. I don't know. I don't have a crystal ball. Um, um, but they introduce their own set of problems. Right. You have problems from dumb robots and you have problems with smart robots. <laughs> And, right, and they're different kinds of problems. Um, and that, that also gets, gets wrapped up in this. I've seen, I've been, I've sat in debates. I'll just make this last point and then I'm sure we got lots of questions coming in. But um, I have sat in debates at the United Nations where people, I, for a number of years actually, <laughs> uh, which is both interesting and a little, it's a little boring to be honest. Uh, there's a great New York Times documentary on a Thomas Hopkins that came out a, a couple months ago that um, I think captures the issue very well, but also captures some of the flavor of the UN discussions, uh, which is really worth, it's like a few minutes, it's a short video documentary. Um, it's worth checking out. But um, I've sat in these debates where I've heard countries debating this topic, just totally talking past each other. Because some people are like thinking in this really near term um, and the state of the technology today and tomorrow, and some people are thinking 30 years down the road. And so it's, um, it's a challenging issue, but I think an important one. And, uh, and personally, I, I find one very fascinating. 
So you started to kind of allude to the different the different actors who all have a various stake in this, whether it's NGOs who maybe are arguing for a ban, or certainly a number of countries that are arguing for not banning autonomous weapon systems. Um, but we see some variation between countries as well. Um, what is your sense of whether other countries have the same standards and definitions for autonomous weapons? Um, uh, between each other. For instance, would the United States consider one weapon an autonomous weapon and China would not? Yeah, I mean, this is definitely part of the problem is there are different definitions among countries. So first of all, not many countries have defined autonomous weapons. Many of them have not. But I'll just give three clear examples of these are three countries that you would want to agree. Um, and they have very different definitions. Um, the United States, China, and the United Kingdom. They all put out public definitions and they're all completely different. So the U.S. one, it's like, it makes it hard. So the U.S. one, I'm going to paraphrase, okay, all of these because I'm doing this from memory. Um, but if people are interested, we can follow up with kind of the specific, you know, links afterwards. Happy to, to send it out via Twitter. Um, so the U.S. definition would come from the um, U.S. Defense Department uh, Directive on Autonomy and Weapons. Uh, DOD Directive 3000.09, which has um, what is at least intended to be um, a rather um, technically precise definition. Um, there are still areas where there's a lot of gray area. It's a, it's a real challenge in the space, uh, but it's intended to be precise. Uh, I can say that with some confidence because I was, <laughs> I was involved in, in writing it. So the intention was precise because um, it's intended to give guidance to weapons developers. So that directive came out in 2012 really before any of these international conversations were underway. It was before the UN meetings had happened. It was before um, the campaign to stop killer robots was launched, which was launched a few months later. So you know, it was really intended to give guidance to the people building weapons in the US military. And it's intended to be clear. There are still problems with that, but it's intended to do that. And it's, um, it's a definition that would um, include a lot of things that you could envision building in the relatively near term and it's agnostic to the intelligence of the weapon system if that makes any sense so it's, it's a definition that involves the types of functions the weapon system is performing it doesn't depend upon how smart it is and how much cognitive reasoning is behind it right so if you built a weapon system that is out in the battlefield and it's flying around and it has some ability to sense targets and make some selection criteria about which targets to attack, and it does those without human permission, that would be considered an autonomous weapon, okay? Now, I contrast it with the UK definition, which has, their definition has sort of put the goalposts, if you will, for autonomous weapon very far out into the future, and involves, again, I don't remember the specific framing, but basically it's talking to like human level reasoning, right? So that's totally different. So that's basically talking about kind of like science fiction vision, something that would not really be realistic in the near term, but would be a big leap forward in AI technology and would be something that would sort of be doing human level reasoning and judgment about the battlefield. So that has practical effects, which one of them is which to say that like the UK could say, for example, with a straight face, based on their definition, they could say something like, um, uh, sorry, I'm, we're all in the home environment. I'm getting a little bit of just disruptions. Apologize for that. Lost my train of thought. Um, so uh, the UK has a definition um, where for them, they would uh, be able to say with a straight face, you know, we have no intention to build autonomous weapons and we don't even see a need for that like anywhere in the near future. We don't even know if it's technically possible because their definition is like, one that's like requires like a lot of leaps forward in AI technology. And that would still give them a lot of freedom to build a lot of things today. Now contrast it with a third example, China, who's put out this definition that I'll just be honest, it doesn't make any sense. It's very confusing. They put out five criteria for them. Um, and, uh, and you could read the criteria online. They put it out in a white paper. And it basically involves things that would be like totally beyond human control, inherently indiscriminate, weapons that are like by, by their very nature would be unlawful to begin with. Um, and probably no one in the right mind would want to build. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, 
possible, I guess, that that's a function of incompetence. Uh, but if you take it, you know, that maybe the professional diplomats at the People's Republic of China know what they're doing, uh, and I would assume that they're competent, then it looks a lot like political maneuvering that allows China to say, which they have said publicly, that they support a ban, but they've crafted the definition in such a way that doesn't really ban anything, actually. And they get to kind of have their cake and eat it too. Um, and so that's, that's like just the three examples where, um, yeah, it's super hard on the space because people can make these statements about autonomous weapons and they're actually talking about different things. So another element of this uh, kind of ongoing conversation about, about definitions and about what it actually means to have an autonomous system, whether it's an impossible future technology that doesn't exist or something that's here today, um, what does it mean to be talking about meaningful human control? And is the question of humans in the loop or humans on the loop really the right framework to be thinking through those issues? Yeah, that is such a, it's a great question and it's a loaded it's a loaded term. Um, so a, you know, a couple of years ago in the UN oh, Sorry, process, I also just want to remind everyone to send in some questions. Um, keep them coming, but please continue. Yeah, yeah, please, more questions, more questions. Um, so meaningful human control um, is a topic that is, it was raised a couple of years ago in the UN process um, by some NGOs. And I think, you know, originally, if I can, I'm going to speculate here a bit. Um, they raised a sort of an idea of a positive framing of the idea of a ban, right? So, you know, we have on the one hand this idea of we need to ban autonomous weapons, whatever they are, definition kind of TBD at this point, but like we want to ban them, we want to restrain countries from building a technology. Well, that gets, you know, it appeals to certain actors, but a lot of countries, you get a lot of pushback from that because they say we're tying our hands, we don't want to do that. The world's a dangerous place, right? That's why countries have militaries is because they don't trust other countries, right? So, you know, maybe they're not comfortable giving up certain technologies, particularly when they don't know what the technology is going to look like. So one of the, this is, a, this is a bit tangential, but this is, I think, a really important point in this space, which is one of the challenges here, as well as an opportunity, is that autonomous weapons don't yet exist. So... One of the reasons why that's an opportunity is it is um, to some extent harder to pry a weapon system out of countries' hands. They already have it in their inventory, right? They're used to it. They see its value. It's baked into their planning. Um, it's baked into their, their force structure and their design. There are constituents within that nation, um, within perhaps their defense industry, within their bureaucracy, within their legislative system, whatever that is whether it's a Congress or a parliament. So like that can be much harder. Um, and so in some ways it can be easier to preemptively ban weapons before they're created, right? On the other hand, what can make it harder sometimes is if the value of the weapon is uncertain, right? Then you might get countries less willing to give it up. So the fact that you, you autonomous weapons don't yet exist and you're talking about a preemptive ban um, has, as you know, different challenges or different um, aspects of it than say other similar humanitarian disarmament campaigns in recent memory, like those to ban landmines and cluster munitions. Um, and in particular, one of the things that I think is particularly different and relevant here is that for landmines and cluster munitions, the weapons existed and they were causing very real humanitarian harm, right? And so you could point to them and you could say, look, these people are being harmed by these weapons, right? These people are being killed, they're being maimed, they're having, you know, they're losing limbs. Like, th this is a real problem today. Um, and that doesn't exist for autonomous weapons today, right? It's speculative. You have people sort of saying, it could be really bad. You have people saying, well, look, maybe these things would be better. They'd be more precise, they'd be more humane than humans. Um, just like self-driving cars will someday uh, the goal is to save lives on roads. Maybe a Trump supplement could do the same in war. Now, you could believe that or not, but that's an argument that you have some people making, right? Um, the other side of it, though, is that um, militaries don't yet know what they're giving up, right? And so that, that, I think, degree of uncertainty for militaries is really important because there is often a perception when it comes to autonomous weapons 
that they could be this like total game changer, right? And, and they could give militaries this decisive advantage on the battlefield. I'm not actually convinced that's necessarily the case, um, but I do think that it, that can lead to a lot of reluctance to give them up. Um, uh, and with that, I, I, I actually, I had lost my train of thought and forgot your question. What was the question? Uh, we're uh, starting out with a framework of sort of humans in the loop on the Oh, loop. meaningful human control. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, right. Okay, I'm sorry. I got diverted there. So, so meaningful human control, right, was brought up as kind of this positive framing from a band, right? And, and you saw instantly a lot of countries latch onto it, and it, and it caught a lot of interest. Now, why did it caught on so much interest among countries? Well, a couple of reasons. One is it sounds positive instead of a negative thing. We're not taking away anything. We're just adding a requirement. Um, it also sounds like good, like meaningful human control. Who wouldn't want that? Who wants like meaningless control? That seems like not a good idea. Or like not human control, like that seems dangerous, right? So it seems positive. And also is really vague, which means that it can mean everything to everyone. And so you can have lots of countries be like, oh, I'm in favor of meaningful human control. And it's a positive thing they can say diplomatically. It makes it sound like they're doing a good thing. It you know, takes a little heat off them if they're getting pressure, maybe from the NGO community, but it actually requires them to like make no real meaningful commitments. Um, now, you've had a lot of really great experts um, uh, at institutions like UNIDIR, the UN Institute uh, for Disarmament Research, Article 36, the NGO, um, experts like uh, Dr. Heather Roth, um, right on this topic of meaningful human control and kind of try to you know, put a little bit of meat on the bones of like, what, what does it mean? What should it mean? How do we think about it? Um, and I think there are different ways to approach the problem from either kind of a legal framework or a framework about maybe just what is the existing practice today. Um, and we can chat about that if people want. I think um, two important things to keep in mind are, one is that the idea of focusing on sort of the role of the human has gained a lot of steam in international discussions. I think that is great. I actually think that's a productive way forward, um, which is to sort of say, um, instead of sort of saying, what is the technology we want to ban, which is hard for a lot of reasons, not the least of which is the technology keeps moving, right? So a lot of the reasons for banning a technology could be, it's not very good right now. It's dangerous, right? Let's say you looked at self-driving cars for that reason. You might say, look, self-driving cars are not safe. If we put them on the roads, they're going to kill a bunch of people. Let's ban them. Well, we all sort of realize that like they're going to get better. On what timeline? Not totally clear. How we get them better in a safe way? That's a hard societal question. Like, whose roads do they get tested on? Who, you know, like that, those are really tricky issues. But the technology is still evolving. Same is true for autonomous weapons. Um, I think there's a lot of merit in focusing on the role of the human because it allows us to sort of um, set aside, if you will, some of these issues about, you know, the fact that the technology is evolving. And what's the time horizon we're envisioning the technology? Instead, you could say, well, look, if we had all the technology in the world, let's imagine we could build technology, could do anything. What role would we want humans to play in war and why? I think that's a very interesting question, actually, to ask ourselves. And to say, like, not because the technology can't do something, Let's envision it could. What should humans be in charge of? Because we think there are some tasks in war that only humans should be responsible for. And what are those? And that might be a fruitful area of discussion. And we've seen the conversation internationally shift towards more focus on that and sort of the human element. Now the label that people use is, um, is a bit contentious what the bumper sticker is. Um, meaningful human control as like a specific label, right, is, is a bit politicized because it is associated with the idea of a ban. And that is not by accident. That is because um, in many of the international discussions, um, leaders from the campaign to stop killer robots have said, meaningful human control equals a ban. They have said, <laughs> said that to the diplomats. And so there are going to be some countries that are super allergic to that like bumper sticker. They're like, we don't want meaningful human control. They want something else. The United States government has said, we don't like meaningful human control. We want appropriate human judgment. But what is the difference between those things? I don't know. I honestly, I don't know, right? 
I spent a lot of time in these discussions. I don't know because none of those terms are defined. Um, so you get some some flavor of that. And and if you look at the um, the UN uh, documents from the the um, the GGE, the Group on Governmental Experts, coming out of the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons. Realize that's a very awkward title. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know. It's very strange. Um, the convention, I don't know why convention's in there twice, but um, the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons, the CCW, uh, those documents, which are written by consensus, have you know some very carefully managed language about this topic. So if you read through them, actually, they don't say meaningful human control. They'll say other things like appropriate human involvement, right? They kind of like, you know, or the human element. They'll like similar-ish things that just avoid some of the more politicized terms so that they avoid picking a side. Um, but I think that it is a topic that's gaining interest. And I think it's actually a very fruitful one for further discussion um, for nation states and for academic experts and others, to, you know, ethicists and you know, legal experts to dig into to try to better understand. And in some ways, I think it is the crux of the question before us, which is what is the role we want humans to play in lethal decisions in war? That's, the, that's really ultimately the question we're grappling with. And the technology should be in service of that. But if we figure out what is the role we want humans to play, then we can say, all right, how do we best use technology as it evolves to help achieve that goal? Because um, technology, it's just a tool, right? And so we get to decide how we use that tool. So it does seem like, as we, as we focus in on autonomous weapons in that conversation, it's as much a conversation about humans and warfare as it is about technology. Um, and it comes up a couple of times in your thesis as well that you discuss this idea that, you know, no matter what new technology enters in warfare and how we use it and potentially stretching out the battlefield, the violence is inflicted on people. That is how warfare works and that's not going to change. Um, so as we envision a hypothetical future war where both sides have lethal autonomous weapon systems, what does that look like? Who is fighting who? How do you win that war? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know, but I've thought about it a little bit, so I have some, some guesses, I guess. Um, I would say that there are, let me just point out there that in the public debate, there are kind of like two competing visions often, which are both a little bit politicized, right? In the sense that I think the actors putting this forward have kind of an interest to paint a picture that's either overly scary or overly rosy, okay? The scary version is like killer robots run amok murdering everyone, right? That's kind of one story that's being told by, um, um, by activists, um, by, you know, who are sort of interested in, in uh, a ban on a time surface. Now, I would say people probably believe at least some degree of that, or they, they, they wouldn't, that's what's motivating them to want to ban, right? Um, but there are some areas where, like, when I look at some of the details, I say, like, that doesn't really hold up. You know, I'm not sure that that, that, um, that, that holds water, right? Um, and we can talk about some of those details if, if you want. There's, a, there's another vision, which is you often hear nation states um, who want to preserve freedom of maneuver, painting this, I think, one is an overly rosy picture, where they're like, well, these would be super precise, and they look with totally spare civilians, and, like, what would be pristine and clean, and, like, you know, it would be great. And like, well, like, and that seems also perhaps not very realistic. Um, um, I think that um, my best guess is that we would see over time the accumulation of atomic weapons in a large way. Let's say, let's say that we entered a world where militaries had used lots of atomic weapons and they were heavily in the inventory, right? Um, that we would likely see a war that is more violent, that is faster paced, and that is less under human control. Um, I would say not entirely. Militaries do have some incentives to keep their weapons under their own control, right? They don't want to lose control of their weapons. They don't want them to attack the wrong targets. They don't want them to attack their own forces. But militaries care um, to greater and lesser degrees about this, and they care differently about different kinds of accidents, right? So, um, you know, an accident that results in fratricide against their own forces, militaries might view differently than an accident that 
cause civilian casualties versus an accident that maybe attacked the wrong enemy target and maybe escalated things in an inappropriate manner. Um, and, you know, some militaries can be more or less willing to tolerate fratricide or more or less willing to tolerate civilian casualties. Um, you know, in general, I think, um, I would say that one of the challenges that militaries have when it comes to accident risk, which is often what we're talking about here, is, you know, the, all weapons have safeties of some kind or another. Even a knife is held in a sheath so you don't stab yourself with it, all right? So all weapons have some kind of safety on them because they're inherently dangerous and you don't want them to cause harm to the wrong person, yourself, friendly forces, a civilian. Um, but too many safeties can inhibit the usability of the weapon. And um, you don't want sort of too many, you can think about, for example, let me give an example of firearms, right? Um, the way that police officers in the United States carry their firearms and the way military professionals carry their firearms are quite different, actually. Um, there are many more safeties on the holster that a police officer has on um, their pistol than, a than someone in the military would. Because a police officer uh, is most likely to be shot by his or her own firearm. And so there's a lot of safeties on it to make sure that if they get into a tussle with someone, either the person they're wrestling with doesn't pull that police officer's firearm out and accidentally shoot them with it. Uh, that's less of a concern for militaries. And so there are less, just like the physical contraptions of the holster are less cumbersome. Um, and you can scale all this way up to nuclear weapons. We have like a whole host of safeties and safeguards in place to make sure they don't accidentally go off or there's not an unauthorized kind of use. Um, and even still, we've had some like really, really frightening near misses with nuclear weapons. Um, so, you know, in general, I actually think that militaries tend to undervalue accident risk. Um, that it just, it's sort of like in the scheme of balancing accidents versus you know, falling behind an enemy, they tend to prioritize keeping pace with an adversary, all right? So if you're looking at a relatively new technology and you tell a military, I have this new technology X, it's in this black box, it works, kinda, most of the time, there might be a risk of accidents. I don't know how likely the accident risk is. I'm not even sure if it goes bad, how bad that might be. But I do know that your enemy is building the same thing and they are in a rush to deploy it. The knee-jerk response of most militaries is gonna be get it out there. We don't wanna fall behind, right? And I think that's a real tension with autonomy and artificial intelligence. It's a real, it's a real risk of a, um, a, what you might call a race to the bottom on safety. Uh, people saying we need to get it out there quickly. Um, and you see people deploying things that are just unsafe. Um, but there's also a risk that even if they function properly, we shift into a domain where War is operating at a tempo that is faster than humans can respond. Some Chinese scholars have referred to this as a battlefield singularity, a sort of tipping point where the pace of action on the battlefield is faster than humans can really keep up with it. And you have to kind of take your hands uh, off, of, off of the controls and let it interact. Let the machine do its thing because the humans, uh, they're too slow. Uh, some American scholars, uh, John Allen and Amir Hussein have used the term hyperwarp to refer to this. Um, and they put out a, a short, you know, short book, a proceedings article and a short book and edited volume on this, uh, the opportunity to contribute kind of one chapter to this. Um, and others have written on it since then. You know, I tend to think that, I tend to see that as a, a bad thing, actually, right? Like that's a little bit, probably not a good world for us to be in, um, where war is operating at machine speed and there's less human control over what's happening. Um, it's also possible that competitive pressures push us there uh, either way. And that's a real, that's, I mean, that's kind of one of the real dilemmas in this space is this, is, I mean, this is the essence of the security dilemma. You can have things that both sides do to make themselves more secure and it results in sort of a net outcome that's less secure for all. Uh, and that is a real risk of this technology. So when we think about speed and autonomy, maybe the, the best case to draw lessons from and where we're already seeing it is when we think about um, autonomous systems in cyberspace. Um, so can you talk some about what we're already seeing, um, particularly AI for offensive cyber operations um, and 
AI, of course, being <laughs> broadly defined, and then also sort of uh, autonomous systems and cyberspace generally and how that relates to competition between war and peace. Yeah, that's a great, a great question. And I think one of the most interesting areas to explore here, like if there are, um, if people on this call, on the webinar, or like other researchers working in this space, I would just say this is an area that I think is like ripe for like a lot of really interesting scholarship and work on um, the intersection of AI and autonomy with, with kind of cyber issues on both offense and defense. I think it's generally very underexplored. Um, in part because like they're both just very technical like the ai and autonomy and cyber and like merging the two is like hard but um so one of the things that's interesting is in some ways there is already a lot of automation in cyber tools and has been for a long time so um a worm for example propagates you know itself across a network so go back to the first you know internet worm uh, in the 80s like it's a self-propagating kind of, and it's a very limited kind of autonomy. It's not very smart, very simple, uh, but it does that. And we've seen since then very incremental advances in, um, in malware that can do things um, like, you know, automatically um, link to certain sites and then download kind of updates. I talk in my book about some of the things that the like, Conficker could do, the one from a few years ago. Um, they're very, like, very incremental advances in automation um, to help allow malware to spread, uh, of course, on its own, to infiltrate uh, systems on its own, um, botnets, you know, by their very nature sort of have a lot of automation, but they're still, of course, designed by people. And then really like sort of you know, largely today linking back to humans that are then giving them some direction or humans are writing updates to software kind of code. Um, so that's kind of one just sort of aspect of things today. The other interesting dimension of this is if you, if you look at advertisements for cyber defenses, it's like, oh man, they're like peppered with AI, machine learning and blah, blah, blah. And so like, if you drive like in the San Francisco Bay Area, you're like on the billboards. It's, last time I was out in the Bay Area, obviously not super recently, last time I was out there was right at the same time of um, RSA, the big cyber conference. And just billboard after billboard of companies advertising like we have artificial intelligence and machine learning and you know it's hard to know how much of that's real i'll just be totally honest with you like a lot of things the term ai is used so loosely these days it's like it's such a hype it's like you know what big data was maybe a few years ago that people are throwing ai all over the place and in some cases it's like yeah they're doing deep learning it's what you maybe would call ai not that ai only refers to deep learning it's a big tent there's a lot of methods of ai but at the same time so there's people using the term AI to refer to like, you know, a spreadsheet. And you're like, well, I'm not sure that's really AI. Um, when I've talked to like independent academic experts on this, um, what I'm often been told is that, you know, a lot of the state of the art is still, um, <clears throat> you know, not quite using a lot of, maybe a little bit of machine learning, but it's still like really humans are very involved. There's some degree of automation. Um, I think some of the most frightening things actually is some of the technology that's come out of the Darko Cyber Grand Challenge, um, which was a few years ago, that was back in 2016, um, but involves automated bug discovery and exploitation. Um, I, so I would say actually patching or exploitation. So it's automated tools, um, fuzzing is the technical term basically to, to look through software, um, find bugs, and then either patch them um, you know, sort of fixing holes in them, and, and that is a defensive tool, or exploiting them offensively, um, and uh, using them as a way to, to, you know, for malware in an offensive context. It's basically totally dual use. And some of those tools are now out on the web, like what are the, the not the winning team, um, the winning team, which came out of, spun out of Carnegie Mullen, um, they're uh, doing work for the Defense Department now, um, um, but the, one of the teams in the DARPA Cybercrime Challenge, they like put their software up on GitHub and people can download it and use it. And you can imagine some of these tools being repurposed for more advanced forms of botnets and malware that instead of malware today, that is like designed with a particular exploit in mind, um, say in um, Internet of Things devices, you know, going out and, and grabbing a hold of insecure IoT devices. You can imagine future malware that is some of these automated tools 
And it's not really like self-learning or anything like that, but it has automated abilities to scan devices, say IoT devices, for vulnerabilities, and then find and exploit them. And that might increase the sort of the, um, the types of targets that it could exploit and make it just much more effective and hard to stamp out. And so some of those, you know, things are troubling um, in terms of where the technology uh, is, uh, is going. And I think poses real risk, particularly in a world where we are putting, you know, billions, tens of billions of unsecured IoT devices out there. Um, I mean, I think this is a bit off topic, but like, if there's one thing that we should be learning, um, well, there are many things, but maybe one lesson from this pandemic uh, is that we need to expand our horizon in the national security world, but what we think about as risks and be prepared for unexpected shocks. Um, and I do think that, you know, like we are, we are running the risk of some nasty surprises in the cyber world. Um, and there are probably things that we need to be doing to shore up those cyber defenses now uh, ahead of time. So, kind of looping back around to this central role of humans, um, there is an impossible tension, I don't think it'll ever go away, between you know, wanting to take advantage of all the benefits of automation or autonomy, um, the speed, the, the things that uh, these systems are just better at humans at, um, and also trying to foster kind of a healthy suspicion of the ways that they can be brittle or they can fail catastrophically in ways that humans would not. Um, and especially as we run into issues with kind of transparency of the decision making or even automation automation bias where when the decision making is transparent it can still lead to pretty catastrophic outcomes um how do you think that kind of human machine relationship looks going forward because it's unlikely to be a fully human or fully machine system moving forward yeah i actually i think you articulated it pretty well <laughs> i <laughs> think you think you got it there um i mean i think that's the right answer which is to say that, that you know humans and machines are good at different things we're going to want a, a blend of those um I think one of the things that's hard is sort of where you might find that balance of task. What are the things that should be done by humans? What are the things that should be done by automation? That's going to shift over time. Um, and that's going to be a challenge, particularly for the military, where we build things in these very low time horizons, right? So, so part of this is issue of sort of tech refresh. That's, that's one problem. Um, but there's also, I think, really important issues you highlighted it's not just about like, like what we allow the human and the machine to do, but how we integrate them effectively. These issues about transparency and user interfaces, um, you know, and making sure the human is making an informed decision. Um, all of that suggests that like, you know, you want an iterative process between developers, like the technology developers and the users. So they're kind of going back and forth on this. Um, I think it also suggests that we want to think really hard about what is the philosophy underpinning certain kinds of systems. So I can give a couple examples of different design philosophies. Okay, so let's let's think about for, first of all, I'm um, driving because I, I it's just I guess it's a more tangible example, right? The philosophy of the Google Car um, is one of taking the human out of the role of driving. The philosophy is basically like, you know. The human's the problem, the human's the weak link. We need to design out the human, okay? Um, that's one philosophy. That might be the right one, it might be the wrong one, I don't know. You can imagine, this is a bit, I would say, you can imagine a different car company, like let's say BMW, taking a very different approach where the goal is, you know, changing the driving experience. It's that like, right, like their whole, their whole brand is about like the experience of driving um, a BMW being a rewarding experience and being one where like, you know, maybe actually like a car without a steering wheel is not what they want. Maybe it's not consistent with their brand. I don't know. I'm speculating here. I, I, don't, I don't know what their long-term vision is, right? But you can imagine some, that's a different, that's a different philosophy about what driving ought to be, what the driving experience should be. Now I'll translate that into the military space, right? Um, two very different examples are um, that I talk about in, in my book or the, um, the Army's Patriot Air and Missile Defense System and the Navy's Aegis Combat System. Um, and I think they're an interesting contrast in these philosophies in part because they perform basically the same function, which is air and missile defenses. And they're built by the same company. 
we'll probably the same defense contractor. And so they have all, and the same sort of de degree of technological, technological maturity, if you will. They were both originally designed like in the 80s and were upgraded over, over time. Um, but very different design philosophies. So the Aegis is, is like highly customizable um, and allows the Aegis crew to input what they call doctrine, which you might think of as programming statements to the machine, um, to give it different sort of like guidance about what to do in different settings. If you have a missile coming in and it's, it's this altitude or this direction from the ship, um, these are different actions to take. They could program all these ahead of time. They start this process months before deployment and then they continue tailoring it up through the deployment and then even during the deployment to adjust to the environment and then they can basically have different kinds of doctrine statements that they can activate in different settings. So it's basically like infinitely customizable and programmable. Contrast it with the Patriot system, which, um, which had like a few modes, only a handful of modes that a user could activate and could use. Um, so they had much fewer freedom for the actual user. You also had very different levels of expertise um, who were being involved. For the Aegis, it's basically the ship's captain. So it's an 06, um, you know, very senior ranking, somebody who's got like 20 years of experience in the service. For the Patriot, it could be as low as a second lieutenant, somebody who has only actually like months in an operational setting. Um, somebody who's you know, maybe like a, you know, a year under the belt um, in the military. Um, in like at which direction an operational unit out of training. So very different concepts. And you can think about sort of philosophically, the Aegis, the way it works is about, um, it's designed in a way to capture the intent of, let me back up a second. Autonomy is ultimately about capturing human intent. You can think about it as a flywheel for human agency. I didn't come up with that term, but I really kind of like it of sort of capturing human agency and putting it into this machine like a flywheel captures mechanical energy and storing it and being ready to deploy it then in the right setting. The question is, which human? And the Aegis is designed to capture the intent of the ship's commander and capture that person's, his or her intent and embody it into the machine's programming and then use it in the setting where it needs to be employed. For the Patriot, it's actually the engineer's intent. All of that's been baked in ahead of time, and there's much fewer sort of switches and bells and whistles for the human with, with you know, rank on their shoulder, the military commander, to actually um, employ. They are given much more freedom of action. That's different. Both of them are human intent, but where does that happen in the process? How early is it baked in? Is it the engineer or is it the military operator? They have very different roles in the system. They have different responsibilities when it comes to the use of lethal force. Um, and also some of it depends upon like how tailorable do you want it to be based on context? Do you want it to always do one thing or do you want it to be variable based on the setting? Um, so I think those are some of the, the things that might inform how you approach these issues that you're raising about balancing kind of human machine teaming. So pivoting a little bit and realizing that we're running up against time a little bit, um, you recently had a virtual event with Bob Work on joint command and control, and there is a clear emphasis on algorithmic competition. Um, Bob mentioned this Chinese notion of systems confrontation. Can you speak to what this actually looks like kind of over the next couple of years? Uh, this notion of AI-fueled cyber warfare moves well beyond human capabilities, and how does that play into the discussion of automated weapons? Yeah, um, so I think there's a couple components of this. One is, I think, uh, the discussion we were talking about is really about competition at this system level, meaning sort of the operational system that militaries employ and put on the ballot. Um, I think oftentimes in the US military, we tend to look at competition vis-a-vis -vis our adversaries in a platform versus platform level. We'll be comparing our aircraft to their aircraft. And in many of those cases, our stuff stacks up better. But that's not the way we actually fight. You fight sort of force versus force, and our um, aircraft, our ships, our submarines, our you know ground soldiers operate in a system cohesively, right? So if our aircraft, as we found in war game after war game, if our aircraft don't have tankers, 
for example, because the PLA shot them down or they don't have AWACS um, because they've been shot down or we don't have, you know, um, resilient communications links because our satellites have been jammed or they've been shot down through kinetic means or otherwise disrupted or, you know, we've lost um, our position navigation and timing. All of those things go into having sort of an effective system, a warfighting function that can actually work. And, and those things are like vitally important. Um, so, you know, it's all got to kind of work together. And I think that's one of the, that's one point of discussion. Um, and I do think you see that shift happening in the U.S. military. I think it's important to emphasize in particular, because it is, it is my view. I had an article out in Defense uh, One recently, a few months ago, with my colleague Iniki about this, um, that we are likely to see the most dramatic changes in digital technologies that are riding some of these sort of exponential growth curves um, in digital systems. And so we're likely to see the most dramatic changes in military capabilities like electronic warfare, command and control, sensing, um, artificial intelligence, data fusion, um, these, these kinds of digital things. And they are likely to accumulate the big effects on command and control. So thinking about like how do we rapidly adjust and innovate in command and control is like very, very important for achieving um, military dominance in the decades ahead, particularly against you know, uh, um, a technologically advanced adversary like China. But the broader thing about AI, you know, how do we sort of win in a world of AI competition? Um, part of that's about having important foundations, foundations in data, right? We need to like get ahead of the curve of data management um, inside the department. This is one of the consistent things that I, talk, I hear when I talk to people in DOD today, uh, trying to use AI to do things. You know, most of the machine learning methods are very data intensive. And so you got to have your data house in order. And we really don't in DOD. It's fragmented. People don't want to share their data. It's in like these weird stovepipe systems. What I hear consistently from people is it took us, you know, six months, nine months, to get access to the data and get it cleaned up in a usable format. Once we did that, we had a model in two weeks. The model's the easy part. We could train the model, but it's getting the data that's hard. And those are actually the bureaucratic problems. They're not technological problems predominantly. They're bureaucratic and organizational problems of how do we like, how do we save data? How do we become a data-friendly organization, a data-first organization? If you contrast the way DOD treats their data, with the way tech companies treat the data, it's night and day. Tech companies treat data as a resource. They hoover up data, right? All the time. Data, maybe they shouldn't be, right? Like, I mean, that's a that's another issue. Um, I, I do, I'm in favor of like um, the United States having some comprehensive data privacy legislation. Um, I'm, you know, fingers crossed, we see that in the next couple of years. Um, but they're just, they scoop up data and they, they, they they hoard it and they see it as a resource and they're like, we'll figure out ways to use this data later. The DOD does the opposite. We throw it away. We've been at war for 20, you know, almost two decades. And where's the data from that? Most of it we've just thrown away. We have millions of hours of like drone footage. We've thrown it away, right? Because we see data as um, a burden and we don't store it. And you know, that's, that's got to change. We got to find ways to like, save the data, start using it as a resource. That's part of it. Cloud computing is part of it. We need cloud infrastructure to actually build these AI applications and use them. We need compute infrastructure. We can't do it, right? So we can't even get to um, the more advanced stuff like machine learning and using machine learning applications because you know we're years behind the private sector. I just basic things like cloud infrastructure. It's 2020 and we can't get a major cloud contract underway. Um, because of like deep, deep structural problems in uh, the military industrial complex, right? And things like every time you let out a big contract, people protest it and they, they throw a, they throw, you know, a wrench in the works. So these are all like really difficult kinds of problems. Um, and the talent is another big one. I actually think the talent problems for DOD are a little bit over, overstated, like some of the hysteria that we're going to be locked out of innovation in Silicon Valley with like Google and Maven. I think we're fine. Um, we have a lot of companies that want to work with the DOD. Um, and, and I think we're going to be okay on that front. 
I am more worried about some of the broader issues in like sort of the, the national talent competition between the US and China. Uh, we're in a great place uh, there because people want to come to the US. Nobody wants to go to China to live there. Like, like no AI researcher from around the world is like, let me go live under the regime of the Chinese Communist Party. It looks like a great place. It's not good. And even like one of the few gens that the Chinese government had in Hong Kong, they're destroying, right? So we have huge advantages there if we use them. Um, but we need to like remain a country that's friendly to immigration. Obviously, this administration has done nothing but damage uh, to us on that front. Uh, we need to be a place where we're bringing in high school immigration, um, including, um, including Chinese nationals. That's a trickier issue because there are issues about uh, espionage and things like the Thousand Talents Program we've got to address. Um, there are issues about um, uh, tech transfer to the PLA that are very real. Um, Alex uh, Joski, I may be mispronouncing his name wrong, uh, the Australian research has done great, great work on this, um, about PLA ties to US academic institutions. That's a real problem. And we've got we've to address those issues, um, but we've got to find ways to do so that doesn't, doesn't you know, sort of disregard Chinese, you know, cut off Chinese nationals as a whole. Um, we've seen proposals out of the Hill from like Senator Cotton that are just, that are just nuts and would really damage the United States if we did them. Um, so, so those are some of the things that I think about in terms of how do we win this AI competition. Well, I would like to wrap up with one final question, knowing that a lot of people here might be uh, certainly interested in the field, maybe students or young researchers themselves. Um, what are you listening to? If you listen to podcasts, what are you reading? What are you learning from that you would recommend, of course, in addition to your own work? Oh, man, there's so many. Um, I love the podcast AI with AI um, uh, coming out of CNA with Andy Ilyshinsky. Um, I think um, Andy is one of the most technically minded um, national security kind of folks. And it's a, it's a very readable, helpful explanation of kind of what's out there. Um, there's so much. I mean, one of the things that I think is great is I see um, new researchers like all the time, like every week coming out with new, um, new, new reports in this space. Um, there's a lot of great work coming out of um, CSET, the new organization at Georgetown. There's a lot of great work coming out of Macro Polo on um, AI kind of related issues. They just had a great report uh, this last week. But Talentful, I, I think tech for gs does really good work. Uh, that's, uh, um, I, I think you guys are doing really, really good stuff. Um, so there's, there's so much that's out there. Um, I think actually one of the things that, um, that uh, the researchers can do in this space is like things like Twitter threads, summarizing recent work on things are actually super helpful, um, relatively easy to do. It's something that are, that are like, you know, for kind of up and coming researchers are easy things to do that help contribute in a really substantive way in the field um, that are worth thinking about too and not like not a lot of effort. Um, there's great stuff. Also, like one other plug, I guess, uh, I really like the work of Unidir. I will say in disclosure, I've done some work with them in the past. I'm not doing anything currently, but I think they're a great um, and kind of like um, balanced and objective resource. I know a lot of these issues of AI and autonomous weapons um, oh, one other that comes to mind would be um, Cipri. If you're not familiar with um, with them, um, Vincent Bulanin and um, uh, Mayaki, man, I, I don't think I'd be able to pronounce her last name properly. <laughs> Mayaki, um, he's done some great work with them. Um, who else is out there? Uh, Sophie Charlotte Fisher does great work in this space. Uh, Meryl Echelhoff just did a dissertation on autonomous weapons, um, does some wonderful work. Um, I'm sure I'm missing some others that are um, great that might slip my mind afterwards. Um, but there's a lot of great researchers out there. Um, that are We're looking forward to your Twitter thread. Staying on top of. Yeah. Um, yeah, those are great recommendations. Thank you for that. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining Technology for Global Security today and to especially thank Paul Shar for taking the time to join us and share his expertise. Um, everyone at tech for also wants to wish you good luck at the CNAS annual conference this week. Um, we hope everyone stays safe and healthy and we look forward to seeing you all at future events. Thank you all. <laughs>